listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. One of the uh, great privileges of being a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary or on staff here over the years is to watch our graduates, uh, our students who have come through, have graduated, and been open for God to use them in ways that uh, are totally unexpected to them and to us. And it is uh, always a, a privilege to be in those kinds of settings. Over the break, I had that kind of privilege to be with some of our grads in various parts of the country where they're kicking a dent for Christ in their uh, community. Uh, so, so fun to watch and so privileged to see that. I feel a, a lot like the writer of one of the Yohannine epistles of John when he said, I have no greater joy than to watch my children walk in the truth. That's certainly true for my physical children. But it's also true in an extended application to our uh, graduates who uh, come through these halls, sit in these seats, go through the classes taught by these men and women and those that came before them and then go out and minister. And today in our chapel is uh, one such person as well. Dr. Abad Shahada is the uh, president and founder of the Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary in Amman, Jordan. Uh, he is, uh, serves as president he serves as professor of theology. He's been doing that since 1991. Uh, Jets has targeted the 22 Arab-speaking countries of the Middle East, Arabic-speaking countries in the Arab Peninsula, in North Africa, and they offer accredited bachelor's and master's level programs. Many of our faculty have taught in adjunct capacities uh, with them. Uh, it's been a privilege to see that school uh, through its, uh, its rise, through the difficulties that come unexpectedly, and that they continue to thrive on behalf of God and his word. Uh, we're privileged to, uh, to have him uh, as a new member of our Board of Incorporate Members here at Dallas Seminary. Uh, he has been voted in. He'll go through orientation uh, with a couple of others this afternoon. He's authored uh, several articles and books and compendiums in Arabic that cover a wide range of need for theological education. He travels extensively in the Middle East for speaking and teaching, and he's married to his bride, Julia, and they have three sons and uh, three grandchildren. Ahmad, my friend, it's great to have you uh, on this side of the water and uh, here on our campus again. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Ahmad Shahada? Thank you. Thank you. What a great honor and joy to be here with you, my professors of old, and um, at this great seminary, this beloved seminary, to use Middle East language, the mother of all seminaries. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really an honor uh, to be here again. It's been a while. Uh, what I will do in the 20 minutes or so uh, time that we have it's, it's sharing uh, an exposition from uh, a famous passage uh, of, of Matthew 28, 16, a part of that passage, but then weave into it sort of a, a report or an update uh, on jets, as so many of the professors here have been to the seminary there in Amman. Uh, so uh, uh, with that in mind, I hope that this will be an encouragement to you all. Um, the text is Matthew 28, 16 and following, a um, well-known passage known as the Great Commission. Uh, but the 11 disciples, this is New American Standard, proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this great commission, which comes in various forms in the New Testament, uh, in a way challenges the very foundations of our faith, our lives, our ministry. And some of you may be wondering, you know, am I really in conformity with this Great Commission? Am I really obeying it? Are my decisions congruent with the, what the Lord uh, wants me to do? Is what I'm doing really in obedience to Him? Or you may be thinking differently, um, 
uh, as I was in my early years at seminary especially, you may be thinking of a, uh, you know, you have a burden on your heart, a ministry of some sort uh, that you're burdened for, but, but it, it carries so many challenges uh, and you just, you just wonder whether it's going to really take off, whether you really, or whether you're really adequate for it, whether you can really do it, or whether you can see the Lord do it through you. Uh, a dream, an impossible dream, let's say. I remember early on in, in my years, even first year, uh, I, uh, thinking about uh, when I'm done through here. If I ever get done, it seemed like so, <laughs> so long a journey. And uh, you know, going back to the Middle East and the challenges facing there, I'll, I'll use this as an example. And you have your own challenges as you think of the future. But some of the challenges we face in the Middle East, and this is Middle East, Arab Peninsula, North Africa. I'm speaking of the, about the 22 Arabic-speaking countries that stretch from uh, Iraq in the east to Morocco in the west. 300 million people of Arab Muslims, <coughs> and uh, the, well, 96% would be Muslim, uh, and 4% would be everybody else. You know, to think that, that, that this part of the world uh, is uh, the home of the early church, now so dominant by a faith that is not really, that is so different than our faith. Uh, not only that, but over there, there's a serious want of liberty. Conversion from the majority religion has a high price, and you know about that. That's a difficulty. Uh, the, the, the church uh, that's made up of, of conversions from that faith are, is, is, is really underground. It's still not, not public. Uh, and you know, this is one of the most difficult things we face uh, serving there. Not only that, but um, uh, we have uh, the teachings uh, uh, that are so different of that majority religion. <laughs> And the way it relates to truth, reality, and the way it speaks of, of God, the nature of God, the nature of salvation, uh, the nature of inspiration, revelation, is so entirely and radically different than our concept. And that, oftentimes that, uh, that, that th those teachings so much infiltrate the, the existing church uh, in the Arab world. And then you have, you have the, the, the um, threat of terrorism. And that's all, all the way around us, uh, that springs or is energized by the documents. You have that there, and there's so much you can talk about that. Then there's a challenge of what's called the, the insider movement, which is a, a very strong and growing movement. Uh, basically, its message out of love uh, is to you know, keep uh, these uh, converts to Christ in, in their original faith, reading their original documents but then adding on a following to Jesus. This is a big challenge for us, and we have to deal with this constantly. Uh, then, uh, on top of that, something you probably never heard about, we're immersed in what's called the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, and, you know, I remember uh, as, a, as a new student here coming, and I'm a Palestinian, uh, studying at a dispensational school. This is as oxymoronic as it can get, you know. <laughs> but, you know, learning to... Uh, <laughs> Learning to, uh, to, you know, the covenants from Dr. P and the other professors, seeing that God's plan uh, for the future and in His grace and faithfulness, and, and learning to be biblical first, uh, uh, Christian first. And then, going, can you imagine going back to that part of the world and, and uh, teach a premillennial perspective? Uh, and that's a very big chance because, you know, this is so important because it's, it's a hermeneutical issue more than anything else. Uh, so there's that, that challenge. Then we have the added challenge of the restraints of authorities to deal with constantly in various ways. Uh, then the, uh, our funding base is so far away. It's here in the West. It's in America. Uh, it's a, such a challenge. We, don't, we have very little funding from the Middle East. And then the question of longevity. Can we stay? Can we do it? And so uh, here, I'm a student at Dallas. I'm thinking, can we really do it? And I, I had with me the... the uh, a study that had done in visiting the Middle East uh, leadership and so forth, that the number one need was to train leaders. And I'm here as a student thinking, can you do it, Lord? Would this be possible? Here's this impossible uh, vision, as it were, to, to think about. Uh, and I think this text uh, is an encouragement to us. As we look at the experience of the disciples, and uh, I invite you to look at this uh, with me. And, uh, and let's, let's see what they went through. We're not the only ones struggling here, but, uh, but here's a mix here that, that they're experiencing. First of all, you have the worship element. When they saw him, they prostrated themselves before him. 
Now, this, this worship is not like the early superficial prostration of people when they would come to the Lord and say, you know, heal so and so for me, and they would worship him that way, or, or like the mother of the sons of Zebedee, you know, she would prostrate herself before the Lord and say, you know, my son, my, would you have one of my sons sit on the right and the other on the left? It's rather the, what Jesus spoke about, about exclusive worship when he talked to Satan and said it's worship to God alone, and it's something that the disciples grew to understand and in later scriptures we see that worship is exclusively to God it's not to a human being it's not to an angel it's only to God you know so there's a there's a maturity in their worship and here are monotheistic Jews <laughs> you know they saw the Lord in his power they saw his teachings they saw his miracles you know they saw him intent on this purpose to go to the cross they saw him die buried and now he's resurrected when they saw him they could not but worship him worshiping monotheistic jews worshiping a human being incredible change but you know, in a way, this really testifies to the Old Testament theology. In other words, when people usually speak of Christianity, the uniqueness of Christianity, they would say, you know, it's really unique in the Trinitarian doctrine, and that's very true. But that's not the only uniqueness of, of Christianity. The uniqueness of Christianity is in the theology. It's the attributes of God. It's his heart for man, his, his yearning to save, his desire that people would trust, know him and trust him his expression, uh, the many mono, uh, anthropomorphic expressions of him, and on and on, this theology of the Old Testament that prepares for the revelation uh, of the New Testament. It's unlike any other monotheistic faith with their documents. It's totally different. It's a unique theology that prepared for the New Testament revelation of the Incarnation and the Trinity. And there you have it. These men, they, as they worshipped Christ, they began to see Certainly after Pentecost, that became clearer to them. They began to see that their, their monotheistic faith fits in with worshiping this human being. God has come down to us. It just all came together. And as they proclaimed the deity of Christ, they did it very simply, without any apology or any defense. You know. So they worshipped him. And in a sense, it was not, it's not like we think. It was not a problem that needed solving. It was more a mystery that needed to be discovered and enjoyed forevermore. So they really genuinely worshipped this risen Christ. But, <laughs> amazingly enough, they also doubted. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Actually, the, gra the grammar can can go either way. Either some of them doubted or they doubted. That is the 11 disciples of all people. <laughs> they worshipped him. At the same time, there's this doubt. And, uh, you know, we ask ourselves, you know, is this doubt due to um, lack of facts, lack of uh, enough evidence? You know, certainly not. They had all the facts you need. In fact, this word doubted, they doubted occurs one other time in the New Testament, and that is in the book of Matthew, also chapter 14, in the account of Peter, when he walked on the water, <laughs> and when he screamed out to the Lord, Lord, save me, and the Lord uh, tried to pull him out and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why have you doubted? Here's that word again. And if you look at what, what Peter had experienced up to that point, he had seen the Lord do miracle after miracle, healings, casting out demons, raising the dead, calming the storms. He saw the Lord walk on water. He himself walked on the water at the commandment of the Lord. Yet, in spite of all of that, he doubted. Then here in our text, they, the disciples with Peter see the risen Lord. <laughs> they worship him genuinely, but they doubted. So this must say that doubt here is not really referring to a deep-seated unbelief. There are words for unbelief in Greek, of course, as you well know. But it's rather referring to a half-heartedness, a hesitancy, you know, if you will, a wavering, you know. This is what's going on. It, you know, basically, it's, it, it's, um, it's asking, you know, it, you know, it's not so much doubting the deity of Christ, as it is their response to him. It's, it's the kind of thing uh, uh, as to what you would do in the face of evidence and facts. It's really not the lack of facts, it's the failure to put the facts together. It's, you know, it's this, this hesitancy, this, um, 
resistance to what's going on, you know. It, it's kind of like uh, the reason behind the reason, if you will. You know, it, it's, it's, somebody has put it this way, it's not really the lack of something, it's rather the presence of something. Again, this resistance to it. This is, this is just so amazing to them. And they, they, they're struggling with it. It's really, in a sense, <laughs> it's really a matter of authority. You know, what do I, how do I respond with all of this? As an illustration of this, um, in Jordan we have a, a monarchy, which means we have a king which means we don't get to vote, which means we don't even have the joy of recounting votes either. <laughs> and, but he has, he has full authority over the legislative branch, executive branch, the, the uh, you know, uh, executive branch, or legislative, judicial branch, he's head of the army, he appoints prime ministers, deposes them at will, you know, he, um, he dissolves parliament at will, um, and so on. Absolute monarch, all authority. But then other, there are other kingdoms in this world that are not this way. Um, for example, uh, the UK, we have a, a queen in this case. The person that really has authority there is, a, is the elected prime minister. And to borrow from uh, an illustration I heard here at DTS over 25 years ago, before gray hair. Um, and, uh, and you know, often spiritually and in ministry, we follow a British system. You know, we go like this, Lord, you are the king. I am the prime minister. <laughs> it's really, you know, worshiping him for who he is, but then at the same time, there's this authority struggle. And you, we ask ourselves, why in the world would they have that? You know, obviously one reason is they're really overwhelmed. Their, their little minds are overwhelmed with this deity of Christ. They're just, it's just, it's, they're blown away by it. But also I think there's another reason why they would be, uh, why they would be um, doubtful like this, half-hearted like this. I think it had to do with the, um, with the place uh, where they were meet, uh, meeting, Galilee. They went to Galilee, to the mountain where Christ has com had commanded them to go. If you recall, uh, the Lord um, at the Last Supper told them, you know, I'll die, rise from the dead, and then after that, I'll meet you in Galilee. He, he told them that at the Last Supper. Um, then on Easter morning, the angel uh, sitting on the stone tells the Marys, you know, um, he's risen. Go tell his, his brethren that he will meet them in Galilee. Behold, I have told you, the angel says. So the Marys rush out, and lo and behold, the Lord meets them. And he says the same thing. Go tell my brethren, I will meet them in Galilee. And here in our text, you know, it's Galilee. They meet him in Galilee finally. So what's, what about Galilee? Well, you know, as you know, the, the Lord spent most of his ministry time in the north, in Galilee. When it was time to go to the cross, he went south, went to Jerusalem. You know, faced what he faced, um, uh, arrest, trials, death at the cross, burial, and then resurrection, then back to Galilee. You know what this told the disciples? It told them it's business as usual. The Lord has not ended his ministry. He's actually continuing his ministry actually till this day. <laughs> not only that, but he, he is in a sense passing on the baton for them to continue the ministry. But you know what? They are seeing this. They are sensing this. And the reason why this half-heartedness, they are not over, only overwhelmed by the majesty of his person, but also by the majesty of the task. It's an impossible dream. Now, can they really actually go out and proclaim that this Christ in him is the destiny of all mankind? And if I was one of the disciples, I would be overwhelmed too. You know? It's an it's a enormity of the task before them. That's what's going on. So here you have worship, genuine worship, and genuine indecision, half-heartedness, hesitancy at the same time because of all the overwhelming things they are experiencing. Well, is there a resolution? Of course there is. Wherever Christ is present, there's a resolution. You know, the text says, and, the, and Jesus came up to them. You know, whenever Jesus is present, there's a disease, there's healing. Demons, there's casting out of demons. Storms, calming the storms. You know, death, resurrection. Here's there's doubt. 
So we better listen to what he says. There's a resolution to this doubt. Actually, it's always people coming to the, to the Lord. It's always people in, in the book of Matthew. It's only here that the Lord Jesus, he comes to them. So it's really important. <laughs> so what does he say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now watch this. First of all, nobody can say that except him. No one in all of history can say that, can claim that. And watch this, it's all authority in heaven and on earth. That does not leave much else, does it? He's in control all, of all of it. Um, and I'm sure the disciples could think of many, many verses in, in the Old Testament, in the, book, in the Torah, in the books of history, in the books of prophets, in the Psalms about the Messiah, the Son of Man, you know, uh, Daniel, uh, having all dominion and authority and all of that. But, you know, not only that, but here what they are seeing is, you know, we, we get here, um, of course, the disciples grew in this after Pentecost, but what we see here is a glimpse of the inner Trinitarian relationship of this eternal giving of the Father to the Son, you know. And because of this eternal giving, there's a giving here in time and space. So basically, the, which means that the relationship of this one true God with us stems from that eternal relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit without us. And what does that, here's a, Christ is given all authority and you know what that means? It means everything he came to earth to do is guaranteed. You know, he came, took our place, you know, uh, you know be actually became like us, then took our place in our stead to carry our sins. We're forgiven. Then we are clothed with his righteousness. He's, ri you know, he's, he's risen from the dead to, to establish that we have been... Re uh, declared righteous, justified. And then as he's, this risen, victorious Lord you know, pours out his gifts for the church to continue the, the work, and then he's always in control to the end of the days. This is, so his authority is telling us that everything that we have been given is guaranteed and we ought to stay there. It's what he did for us. So our, our ministry would stem from that. So he's saying all authority has been given to me. So what he is saying is this, that the resolution or the healing, the, so, the solution to our half-heartedness, to our wavering, our hesitancy, is by clinging on to his sovereignty. The cure to this indecision is to grab on to his sovereignty and all that sovereignty guaranteed for us. This is a cure. This is where we ought to stay and stay there for our lives and ministry. This is it. This is what he's saying, you know, to us. Um, you know, our problem is, you know, we think that authority consciously or subconsciously lies somewhere else, maybe in some committee or some leader somewhere. It does not. Or we may throw in the towel too quickly. That's why we'd not experience his sovereignty. And we, we don't make it in ministry. Or another mistake we make, you know, we... Too often, then, we should follow this open-door policy. God, if you, you know, just open the door for me. But in my experience, it's always been a closed door. Steel, airtight door, shut. And he says, go through it. He specializes in the impossible. He's sovereign enough to do that. In a tough place like the Middle East, that's what, you know, he's, he's got to show up. We can't do it alone, <laughs> you know. And, and, um, uh, and you know, you've got to have this straight, and only then can you have ministry. So as the text goes, therefore, having gone, disciple, by baptizing and teaching. See, it turns out that uh, ministry and missions spring from wholesome worship. And not until, not until we have that straight can we serve, you know. You know, so actually what you have here are two things. First, you have an impossible dream for ministry, for God to use you to his glory in and, and, and saving souls, establishing churches. This is a dream you have for your area, your vision. There's that one impossible vision, but there's something else. <laughs> there's an impossible self that needs to be conquered. An impossible self that needs to worship fully and not half-heartedly. You know, this is what God wants to establish uh, in us. So what about ministry? 
You know, if God so chooses in His grace to fulfill an impossible dream, you know, you just, if, he, if He does it, you sit back and watch it happen. And He overcomes obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. The sovereign Christ, He does it. This is what happened to us in, in the Middle East with jets. We got, we got rejected for five years, rejection after rejection after rejection from the authorities. The story is long. There's not enough time to, rec to say the details. But you know, it's matter, it was a matter of saying, God, if, it's, if this is your will, you've got to show up. We can't do it. And man, he showed up. And we got registered, unprecedented. And the, the person of authority that, did, had, that, that granted us that registration, that license, had no idea what that meant. And the students came from throughout the Middle East, and now we have graduates in 15 countries. You know, Iraq, when we started, there was not a, a single Iraqi pastor worker. There was only five churches pastored by missionaries, Western missionaries. We graduated over 50 Iraqis with bachelor's, master's program. Many of them returned back. Now there are churches from north to south. That's the sovereign Christ. He does it, you know. But then, what about, uh, what about our hearts? No matter how successful you are, you know, God can bring you back to this point of making sure you have pure worship. You know, he'll bring you back to that point. Um, four years ago, we had an unexpected trial that Jets went through. It was so unexpected and so difficult that it challenged the very continuation of the ministry. It was, it was kind of like Jacob's experience. Uh, you know, morning came and behold, it was Leah. And so unexpected. <laughs> Only it was several mornings and with each morning it was, a, it was Leah again. <laughs> You know, we sought to build a campus. We've been in rented quarters, wanted to build a campus. And as, as we began to do this, the Lord provided funds for it, enough funds to do it. We sort of became a target. We were in front page paper attack. You know, we, our tax exemption was taken from us. Student visas were taken from us. Uh, there was an act of sabotage. One building completely collapsed. Uh, we ran out of money. Morale went down, and it just dominoed into all kinds of things. Very difficult, but, I, but you know what? It was the best thing that happened to us because it brought us back to worship. You know, I tell you what, we, we do not serve in order to be justified. We're not justified by ministry. We're justified by what He has done for us already. It's already complete and done. If we lose out on worship, if we go off, so does the ministry. And He brought us back, oh, what? What healing there is in going back to the cross in a new way. What power again, what re-envisioning, you know. And, and while God turned around jets in a way it has never been before, uh, ever ready again for even a bigger challenge ahead, you know. This is God's doing, you know. It, that's, you know imagine what, when God does a great work, imagine if He does the two things, fulfilling an impossible dream, and at the same time, conquering an impossible self. <laughs> Great work of God when He does that, you know. It, it's by clinging on to His sovereignty. And I close with this quote from Hudson Taylor. He said, he said this. He said, every great work for God, every great work for God goes through three stages. At first, it's impossible. Then, it is difficult, and then, it's done. That's God. Cling on to His sovereignty. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, we just, we pause to worship. And we thank You that in Christ, Everything He promised is ours and guaranteed by His sovereignty. Help us always, always to live from there and to serve from there. In Jesus' name, Amen.